All right. So now that I've introduced the concepts, let me go on to some of the evidence. And the report has lots more of this, but I'm just going to uh, give you... Um, give you some evidence here, beginning with intergenerational mobility. Okay? So intergenerational mobility requires you ideally to observe the same variable uh, for, your, for two generations, parents and children. And that's difficult to do with incomes. Um, it's easier to do with years of schooling. Uh, so we start with this graph, which is actually drawn from some work done by Tom Hertz and various co-authors uh, Amer at American University. Um, we took their data and transformed it, and what we have here is what we call the impact of parental education on children's years of education. So this is really, if you ran a regression of the kids' years of schooling on the parents' years of schooling, took the beta coefficient, multiplied it by the standard deviation of the distribution of years of schooling of the parents, then that's what is here. So that's saying a difference of a standard deviation in the distribution of years of schooling of the parents will predict a difference of how many years in the kids. Okay? And if you do that, and you have here a mix of countries that are rich, like Norway and Denmark, but you also have poor countries like rural China and the Kyrgyz Republic and East Timor, um, and you have in the, in the Hertz data seven Latin American countries, and all of them, along with Egypt, are at the very right of the figure, suggesting a great deal of persistence a high impact of parental education on children's education. Okay? So the opposite of mobility. So low mobility in, 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 in terms of educational achievement uh, by this measure. And if we look at achievement rather than attainment, I'm sorry, that was attainment, uh, educational attainment. If you look at achievement instead, it doesn't, it doesn't get much better. Here, uh, we use the PISA data. Are you guys familiar with the PISA data, most of you? So this is the OECD uh, standardized test scores in math, science, and reading. What we have here are the reading test scores from the PISA for 65 countries. And we're looking at two things that you can look for for the PISA. One is the average score. Uh, the average score is normalized to 500 for the OECD sample. So for the whole sample of countries, the, the mean is somewhere around 460 or 470, okay? Uh, so this is the mean performance in reading. And then on this axis, what we've got is again a measure of the impact of parental socioeconomic status on the kid's grade. The PISA questionnaire asks a whole bunch of questions about uh, the parent's education, uh, ownership of durable goods in the household, ownership of books. So the number of books variable is very famous amongst people who look at this PISA literature because the number of books variable is highly predictive. Um, the other day I was presenting this somewhere and they said it's, going all, it's all going to change with the iPad and the Kindle, but it hasn't yet, so the number of physical books still matters. Uh, so, you know, and these lines represent the, 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 the mean of the, of the sample. And this is just a, as a way of showing. So over here, right, the, the bigger number is a bigger impact of the parent's socioeconomic background on test scores. So mobility goes this way, performance goes that way. So you'd like to be where Finland is. Again, people who study the PISA know this, because Finland is always the, uh, the star in this. Mm -hmm. And near, near it is Korea and Canada and so on. That's where you'd, you'd like to be. Notice the US has fairly good average, but a lot of immobility, eh? a lot of persistence. Now, we in Latin America are in the quadrant where you really don't want to be, the opposite of Finland. We are with low averages, and very high persistence, very high impact, okay? This picture from education, attainment and achievement, does seem to carry on to earnings, although in earnings, the information that we have is much less. It's much less because it's, they're very, very, to my knowledge, there are no Latin American surveys, no nationally representative Latin American surveys that contain information on the earnings of the parents of all adults today, including those that are not living with their parents. This is the data you'd like to have, and this is the data you have in these countries to calculate these things. But here, we've extended this, this graph, which is due to Miles Korak, uh, and we put four estimates for these countries. They, you know, Korak, in a subse subsequent work, also looked at these. These are estimates that come from slightly different things, often two sample IVs, and I won't get into the details of them, but they are, they are estimates of the same thing, which is 
Uh, in this case, right, I've just plotted the intergenerational earnings elasticity. So this is the regression of log of the children's income on log of the parents' income. So take children's income, but children who are working, eh, I don't know, 25 to 45-year-olds, whatever. Log that, regress it on the log of your parents. So that is, you know, the sort of elasticity of your earnings with respect to your parents' earnings. So the higher, the less mobile. And this is just happened. I could have just given you bars of that. I've just, I just plotted it against the Gini coefficient because some of you may have heard of the Great Gatsby curve. Have you heard of the Great Gatsby curve? Mm -hmm. So Alan Kruger, who's a famous labor economist at Princeton, but is now the uh, uh, chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors to the US president, uh, gave a speech about a year and a bit ago where he used this graph without the Latin American countries. Uh, that was due to Miles Korak and called it the Great Great Gatsby curve. Uh, to make the, the point of the graph is that, you know, often one would think, often one hears in the popular imagination this idea that you're very unequal but very mobile. It doesn't matter, and this is where, in part of the popular imaginary, the U.S. is. Right? But that that curve is there isn't a trade-off between being unequal and mobile. In fact, if anything, well, they're they're very correlated. There's no suggestion of causality here, but they're very correlated. Uh, both Alan Kruger and Obama made the point graphically that uh, as the rungs of the ladder get farther apart, it gets harder to climb it in some sense. Whether that's true or not, I'm not going to discuss, but the point is Latin America is at that end, okay? Very high inequality and very low mobility. So the intergenerational picture that arises for Latin America is not optimistic. You know, we started, I started with a lot of poverty decline and inequality decline. And now I'm showing you evidence that in terms of transmission across generations, there's still, Latin America is still a very immobile society, countries where there is a lot of persistence. Not all the news is bleak. There is some evidence of improvement. Here is the evidence of improvement we could find. This, in this graph, we have a difference in gaps. It's almost like a difference in differences. It's a difference in delays. So what, what we've plotted here is the delay between where you are in school, the grade you're at, and the grade you should be given your age, in the top quintile of the distribution minus the bottom quintile of the distribution. That delay is lower in the top quintile, so the numbers are negative. Okay? And so this is at age 10, this is at age 15, this is at age 18. So at age 18 in 1995, on average in Latin America, the delay in the, in the top of the distribution minus the delay in the bottom was minus 1.4, or the other way. The delay in the bottom was 1.4 years bigger than the delay in the top. Okay? Now, the, the good news is that these lines have been um, moving up, meaning that those gaps in delays have been falling. The absolute levels of the delays have been falling. That you can't see from here, but I'm telling you, they have been falling. And they have been falling faster at the bottom. So the declines, the, 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 the gaps have been declining. Uh, nevertheless, despite that change, family background remains in some sense too important uh, for, uh, for Latin America. And, and in this graph, in this graph, we do one little exercise, which is we take uh, those numbers that are here on this axis, those estimates of the effect of parents' socioeconomic background on kids' earnings, on kids' um, test scores. And that's what is in the green line. Okay? Then you can put school fixed effects in the regression. And what that would do is would say, right, of that impact, how much of it doesn't go through the school the kid is in? So if you think this is a very rough uh, approximation of the following idea, the impact of family background on how your children perform in school comes in a number of ways. One of them is stuff that happens at home, vocabulary, nutrition in some of these countries even, nutrition, vocabulary, stimulation, books you have, resources, all sorts of things that, that you know, those of us who have children, the older ones in the room, know what that is. This is. We do that every day, and that helps explain this stuff. Okay, but it's also which school you put your kid into. Okay, so one thing to take away from this is that everywhere, even in the Nordic countries, there is an impact of family background on test scores. That's a fact of life. 
But very little of it is due to schools in the Nordic countries, whereas in Latin America, a lot of it is due to school sorting. And uh, you know, Flavio and I would not be surprised with that, remembering the schools we went to and other people went to in Brazil. So our educational system is not mitigating that effect uh, in any way, and we'll come back to that in the end. Notice, by the way, the U.S. and the U.K. in this graph. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here's a question for you. So you showed this uh, decrease in uh, years, right? Decrease in gaps in years. Gaps, right? Now, does it also show, do you also see evidence of that scores moving as well, or parental background? So that, so how much of it is just like a change in policy without any change in actual learning? So that's an excellent question. We looked for whether there were changes in gaps in achievement as well. Uh, and for some countries, there was a reduction in the gap uh, between, say, bottom and top of the distribution. Brazil was one of them, but it was never statistically significant. And it only happened to PISA 2009. Um, if we had try to squeeze something out of it, we could have, but it was really, no, th that is a robust finding, what I showed you. On the, on, the, on the learning, there is no robust finding. But I would also feel uncomfortable with saying there's absolutely nothing there. Uh, you know, it may be, I mean, this is PISA data. One could look, as you know, in Brazil, we have lots of other data that's much, much uh, bigger sats and more representative and so on. One could look at those. And I wouldn't at this point want to say there is absolutely no convergence in there either. But there's certainly much less or much less discernible. So it could be that it's all just that people are staying in school longer and there's no learning. Although then there's also the stuff that you were the expert on, which is that on non-cognitive or, uh, or behavioral skills that are less to do with, uh, with explicit cognition, perhaps time in school actually matters. Right? We're not sure about that. And if that's the case, there are returns to that, of course. So anyway, so a relatively bleak picture on intergenerational mobility. Some evidence of improvements, but only on educational attainment and not really much on other things and a very high level of persistence in Latin America. Yes. Did you look at the effect of number of children and birth order in Brazil? Uh, on educational achievement, yeah. N no. So on number of children, I will have something to say later on about the very rapid decline in family size in Latin America by, by groups. On brothers and sisters, uh, uh, let me give you just an anecdotal answer that's not based on numbers that are here. But in Latin America, unlike, say, in India or most parts of South Asia, uh, there are no gaps, pretty much. And where there are gaps between girls and boys, they favor girls. I mean, Flavio may know more about this than I do, but there, there are gaps that typically favor girls in Latin America in terms both of enrollment and of test scores, except in maths. How about the birth order? Uh, does birth order matter for the test scores? If you ran that regression, it probably would, yeah. Uh, it doesn't, I don't think it affects the mobility story that much, but I'm, I'm sure birth order does matter in that.